Um, so I want to introduce Dr. Farrick Fain next. Um, he is a professor of laboratory medicine and the director of the clinical microbiology laboratory at Harborview at the University of Washington School of Medicine. He also performs basic research there around bacterial pathogenesis. Prior to joining the UW faculty in 2001, Professor Fain was a faculty member at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He is founding director of the UW Interdisciplinary Training Program in Bacterial Pathogenesis and has been editor-in-chief of the important journal Infection and Immunity since 2007. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Fain, who will talk to us today um, for our second talk on COVID-19. And then after that, we will um, have a joint question and answer period for both Dr. Fain and Dr. Shuli. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to join you today to discuss how to prevent the spread of COVID-19 with a focus on healthcare settings. Here are my disclosures. I'll not be discussing any topics relating to my consulting work for BioFire, Cepheid, Armada, or 30 Technologies today. The learning objectives for this talk are to allow you to describe the dynamics of SARS-CoV-2 viral shedding and transmission, to identify the limitations of SARS-CoV-2 PCR testing, to recognize potential routes of SARS-CoV-2 spread in healthcare settings, and to recommend appropriate personal protective equipment to reduce the risk of SARS-CoV-2 acquisition by healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are a high-risk population for COVID-19 acquisition. They've accounted for about 20% of COVID-19 infections that were detected in the U.S., uh, as of the time of the study, among individuals for whom the occupational status was known. In looking at the uh, prevention of SARS-CoV-2 transmission, it's very important to recognize that some infections are asymptomatic. The estimates of the percentage of asymptomatic uh, COVID-19 infections vary widely. But in this review of 16 studies in the Annals of Internal Medicine, they estimated that about 45% of COVID-19 infections overall are asymptomatic. An important question is how much asymptomatic individuals contribute to transmission. This has been a somewhat confusing and contentious issue. Dr. Maria von Kirchhoff at the WHO created a bit of a stir earlier in the month when she stated that transmission by asymptomatic individuals is rare. The next day she had to walk that statement back when she clarified that some people who transmit are pre-symptomatic, meaning that they'll eventually become symptomatic, but they're asymptomatic at the time that they transmit. An important factor in transmission is when do individuals who are infected shed virus. And as shown in this nice analysis from Gabe Young's group, patients who have COVID-19 are already shedding virus by the very uh, moment that they have symptom onset and the respiratory tract shedding declines thereafter, whether or not they have mild or severe illness. We can infer from that that they're actually shedding virus uh, prior to the onset of symptoms, and it's estimated that this is going on for uh, two to three days in the average case. Outbreaks can be analyzed uh, to look at the length of the serial interval between cases and the duration of the incubation period. A serial interval that's shorter than an incubation period overall, as is seen in COVID-19, uh, indicates that a significant amount of transmission is taking place before individuals actually become symptomatic. This can also be assessed by analyzing individual transmission events, as is shown in the right-hand uh, graph from a study in Taiwan. As you can see in the graph, most of the transmission events occurred just before the onset of symptoms in the index case or just after. So the ability of individuals to transmit SARS-CoV-2 before they actually realize they're sick creates a major challenge for case detection and for infection control. Another important thing to know about SARS-CoV-2 is that clinical specimens vary in their sensitivity for detection of the virus. Lower respiratory tract specimens like sputum or bronchoalveolar lavage fluid that generally contain more virus than upper respiratory tract specimens, which are typically obtained, like nasopharyngeal swabs. And this is probably uh, because, as you can see on the right, from a paper from Ralph Barrick's group, that the uh, cells supporting viral replication are variably distributed throughout the respiratory tract. 
But the upper respiratory tract samples, things like nasopharyngeal, oropharyngeal swabs, and saliva are much more accessible than lower respiratory tract samples. And so these tend to be gathered more often. Also, as I've already shown you, viral shedding declines after the onset of symptoms, even in people uh, who are significantly ill, although they can shed virus for longer. What this means uh, for the clinician is that a negative nasopharyngeal swab or really a negative PCR test from any site cannot absolutely rule out the diagnosis of COVID-19, even though the assay itself has high analytical sensitivity. And this ends up having important consequences for surveillance. Even patients who have COVID-19 pneumonia with uh, infiltrates visible by CT scan may test negative by a a respiratory tract swab. In this study from China, 17% of patients who were uh, determined to have COVID-19 pneumonia initially tested negative by PCR, even though uh, they had evidence of pneumonia already on CT scan. In hospital settings, we've repeatedly learned that patients who are not uh, typically presenting with COVID symptoms can pose the greatest risk to healthcare workers. This study at a hospital in China during the early weeks of their pandemic compared the likelihood of COVID-19 acquisition by healthcare workers uh, who were working in high-risk units deemed to be pulmonary infectious disease and ICU departments compared with those who were working in lower-risk GI, trauma, and urology departments. In fact, none of the 278 healthcare providers working in the high-risk departments came infected, even though they were uh, retrospectively determined to have an eightfold higher risk of exposure because all of them were routinely using personal protective equipment that included N95 respirators. In contrast, a 10 out of the 213 providers working in what were thought to be low-risk units were not using masks because of the low clinical suspicion, and they are the ones who became infected. And this story was repeated in New York City when people would come in from uh, trauma, motor vehicle accidents, and so on, not be thought to have high uh, suspicion for COVID-19, and then turned out to be infectious and transmitted to healthcare workers. In the same hospital, environmental sampling was able to detect SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA on used gloves and on high-touch surfaces such as computer keyboards and common-use printers, on doorknobs, and ironically on hand sanitizer dispensers, which I guess makes sense when you think about it. And this suggests the potential for droplet, contact, and fomite routes of spread. At this point, I want to remind you that viral RNA detection is commonly used as a surrogate for detection of virus. But PCR positivity only correlates with culturable virus at a low cycle threshold value. In other words, a high RNA copy number. And PCR positivity persists for a considerably longer period of time than shedding of intact virus. In fact, it's typical for viral acid to be shed in the absence of viable culturable intact virus when one is convalescing from a viral respiratory infection. In this study of nine German patients who had mild COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 was detectable for only eight days in culture after the onset of symptoms, but the PCR positivity continued for about two weeks. So this brings us to a central controversy. Is SARS-CoV-2 spread by droplets or by airborne spread? The distinction between droplet and airborne transmission is based on 1930s research that distinguished the emission of large droplets from the respiratory tract, which could only be transmitted at short distances, uh, less than six feet, that's where the magical distance for uh, distancing comes from, or indirectly by contact with contaminated surfaces. And the emission of smaller particles, uh, really meaning less than five microns, that could remain airborne uh, for much farther distances, uh, was not felt to be relevant uh, to COVID-19. And many of the recommendations to prevent COVID-19 transmission are based on the assumption that transmission is droplet-mediated rather than airborne. This is confusing to a lot of lay people who think if something is going through the air, it's airborne. But really, airborne transmission refers to smaller droplets that can remain airborne for a longer time and can travel for longer distances. This classic distinction has proven to be controversial, and this has important implications for uh, preventing transmission in healthcare workers. 
WHO has emphasized droplets as the predominant uh, route of transmission, which is, uh, I think, the central dogma of, of infection control. But the CDC has been a little bit more circumspect, and they recommend airborne precautions such as uh, N95 respirators when uh, such PPE is available. Now, aerobiology um, has been making a lot of progress since the 1930s, and authorities like Donald Milton from the University of Maryland and Lisa Brousseau at University of Illinois have been noting that the distinction between um, short-range droplet and long-range airborne transmission is really an oversimplification that is no longer supported by modern research. This debate has been compounded by a widespread shortage of PPE, especially N95 respirators, but even surgical masks as well. And this led the CDC to soften some of its recommendations regarding PPE for healthcare workers who were caring uh, for COVID-19 patients. He said, based on local and regional situational analysis, face masks are acceptable when respirators cannot meet the demand, and available respirators should be prioritized for procedures most likely to generate aerosols, which would pose the highest risk. However, recommendations that are based on resource scarcity rather than on optimizing protection have been received with some skepticism by frontline healthcare workers, and this is uh, true at my institution as well, and I'm sure at yours. Contemporary aerobiology studies indicate that a range of particle sizes, ranging from very small particles that can remain airborne for long periods of time to large droplets, are produced by humans, and not only during recognized high-risk activities like coughing and sneezing, but even by the simple acts of breathing, talking, and certainly um, singing. And the intensity of particle transmission is increased as people speak more loudly or breathe more heavily. In a notorious uh, recent superspreading event in my state, Washington State, a choral rehearsal resulted in three-quarters of the members of a choir becoming infected, and it resulted in two deaths. None of the singers uh, reported any respiratory tract symptoms prior to coming to the rehearsal. And singing in a closed indoor space in close proximity to other people is now recognized to be a high-risk activity for a super spreading of COVID-19. In fact, COVID-19 appears to follow the 80-20 rule in infectious disease in which about 20% of infected individuals are responsible for 80% of the transmission. And as many as 70% of infections are thought to be dead ends, resulting in no secondary spread at all. So focusing on the prevention of super spreading events could have a major impact on SARS-CoV-2 transmission and infection control. A group of Japanese epidemiologists studied COVID-19 clusters associated with healthcare, daycare and skilled nursing facilities, restaurants and bars, workplaces, music rehearsals or concerts, karaoke parties, gymnasiums, ceremonies, and transportation settings. And they recommend that people who want to avoid COVID-19 should avoid the three C's, closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowds, and close contact with other people. In contrast to earlier research that said respiratory droplets travel less than six feet, more modern studies are finding that droplets of a whole range of sizes can travel quite long distances, even up to 26 feet shown in this MIT study uh, at the bottom. This image uh, from Lydia Bariba at MIT shows the production of a complex turbulent particle carrying cloud traveling 25 feet from a single sneeze. Someone standing six feet away from this individual would certainly be at high risk uh, for airborne droplets of a whole variety of sizes. Another study of artificially generated virus-containing aerosols found that viable SARS-CoV-2-containing particles remain detectable for at least three hours in air samples and for longer periods of time on plastic and metal surfaces. And what we're looking at here is viral titers uh, detected by culture. So this is a theoretically infectious virus that can be airborne for long periods of time. Such observations seem to be relevant to hospital conditions, as shown in this study from Singapore, 
in which SARS-CoV-2 RNA could be found in a variety of environmental surfaces, including air exhaust vents leading from patients' rooms. And it's hard to imagine how virus would get into air exhaust vents except uh, by traveling long distances by an airborne route. And these aren't patients uh, doing anything special or being subjected to unusual uh, aerosol-generating procedures. This is just with routine patient care. This, uh, to me, provides strong evidence that under routine healthcare conditions, airborne viral spread can take place. And so the old droplet paradigm is starting to give way to a paradigm of short-range airborne transmission of a range of particle sizes that can transmit infection when they're inhaled by other individuals. Since infection likelihood and most likely infection severity are related to the intensity of exposure, putting face masks on both the index case and on their contacts may work additively to reduce the risk of high-level uh, viral exposure and transmission. The importance of concentrated close-range exposure in the healthcare setting can be seen in these data from New York City showing the risk of COVID-19 acquisition by residents according to what their specialty is. The highest risk can be seen to be incurred by specialists who have to work in close uh, range to patients with prolonged face-to-face -face exposure, sometimes without optimal PPE, specialties like anesthesiology, emergency medicine, and ophthalmology. In contrast, the medicine and pediatrics residents were at considerably lower risk, even though they frequently provide uh, care to COVID-19 patients. A face mask worn by somebody who's infected can reduce the atomization of airborne virus-carrying particles. And this study from Hong Kong uh, looked at the emission of both large and small particles uh, that contain coronavirus, and they found that they were effectively reduced uh, by putting a mask on the uh, index person. Face masks have also been found to reduce experimental SARS-CoV-2 transmission in a hamster model. When I read this paper, I first wondered how they got the hamsters to keep their masks on, but it turns out they actually use an ingenious experimental system in which masks were used to filter air that flowed between cages. Interestingly, even in this system, uh, artificial system, the surgical masks were most effective when they were placed in front of the cages that contain uh, the infected index hamsters rather than the cages containing the naive recipient hamsters. And this suggests that some transformation of the particles goes on as they travel through the air, and there's other evidence for this as well. And this is consistent with modeling studies that suggest that face masks worn by infected individuals can protect bystanders in the community settings. So what's the difference between the protection that's provided by a surgical mask and a properly fitted N95 respirator? Surgical masks do a pretty effective job of protecting against uh, transmission of large, greater than five micron droplets, but they do allow a considerable fraction of submicron particles to get through. In these two graphs, note that the um, y-axis scale is different. And so on the left are the surgical masks, and on the right are the N95 uh, respirators. Thus, N95 respirators provide better protection against airborne uh, viruses on small particles. But how does this translate into a real-life setting? In one example uh, published from Singapore, 41 healthcare workers were accidentally exposed to aerosol-generating procedures involving a patient with COVID-19 who wasn't recognized at the time to be infected. 35 of them were only wearing surgical masks, and the other six were wearing N95 respirators. And in fact, none of these healthcare workers developed COVID-19. This doesn't prove that the two kinds of PPE are equivalent, but it does suggest that masks can provide some protection in a real-life setting, uh, even with aerosols. Two randomized controlled trials that were performed in China did see a significantly lower rate of lab-confirmed viral infections and droplet-transmitted infections in healthcare workers who were wearing N95 respirators compared to medical masks. Furthermore, a systematic review that was commissioned by the WHO has concluded that while surgical masks do afford some level of protection against pathogenic coronaviruses, that the protection afforded by N95 respirators is more robust. 
So if you can get an N95 respirator and you're going to be in a significant risk setting, uh, you'll be better off, but surgical masks are certainly better than no mask at all. So putting everything together, my take-home points are the following. SARS-CoV-2 is transmissible for a few days prior to symptom onset, probably peaks about half a day before symptoms come on, and then several days afterwards. And this uh, complicates attempts to identify cases on the basis of symptoms. Although nasopharyngeal swab RT-PCR is highly specific and has good analytical sensitivity, a negative PCR result cannot exclude the diagnosis of COVID-19. This could be uh, because of, of problems with uh, collecting the sample. This could be because the patient peaked earlier and is now starting to clear the virus. It could be because most of the viral replication is going on in the lower respiratory tract. There are a variety of reasons why this could be going on, but you can't rule out the diagnosis uh, with a negative PCR. Most patients who have mild COVID-19 will stop shedding virus within about a week of symptom onset, but some patients will remain PCR positive uh, for longer periods of time, even weeks. Also, some patients will stop shedding, and then they'll start shedding again, and this seems to be uh, pretty normal to see, and it doesn't necessarily mean recurrent disease. Properly fitted N95 respirators provide superior protection against aerosols with small particles compared to surgical masks. But surgical masks are pretty protective and considerably better than no mask, and they're generally effective except in settings with the highest risk, uh, intensive exposure, close spaces, and so on. So universal masking in healthcare centers uh, uh, is a prudent approach to preventing institutional COVID-19 transmission. As Harlan Krumholtz from Yale has eloquently stated, the infection of healthcare workers is preventable, and we should commit to making it a never event. Thanks very much for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your questions.